Well, uh, Dr. Smith, I want to thank you for being here, and I would like you to, uh, if you could, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your work. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for having me here. My background is in geotechnical engineering, and just like you, my first experience was in CIE 337, which was a wonderful experience. I loved it from right from the beginning, talking about fabric and um, how soil has memory. I think I was just fascinated with the subject. And it was also fun because it was the one lab class where you could actually get dirty and really, really get into it. And so from there, I, after I finished my BS in, in engineering over at ESF, I came over and I worked in, I did my master's in geotechnical engineering here at SU. And my work, my specialty was in geotechnical engineering. And my research was in the pore size distribution of geotextiles. So after that, I worked in industry for, with a consulting firm as a geotechnical engineer. A lot of our work was in environmental engineering, and the geotechnical aspects would be in landfill design, slope stability, cover system settlement analyses, mm -hmm. and also in, as a geotechnical engineer in foundation designs, where we actually did subsurface investigations and came out with recommendations for, for the design of different structures. From there, I, I came back to SU and worked on my PhD in civil engineering mm -hmm. and because I was really interested in, in what the research world could, could offer and improve my skills. And then after I graduated um, with my PhD, and my research topic was on soil erosion using geosynthetic products. I next went over to ESF where I was a professor in the construction management department and I taught courses in site solutions and site investigations for improving, improving difficult sites. And now recently I'm back out in industry mm -hmm. and I'm working as a geotechnical engineer. All right, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, sort of describe for us uh, what factors determine uh, what sort of field tests need to be completed for a site investigation or a subsurface exploration of soils? Well, there are lots of different aspects that come in, into play. Mm -hmm. the, the first thing you'd really start out doing is try to find out what information is available. Mm -hmm. You may look at, at soil surveys, and the USDA has soil surveys for areas across the US. So that's usually a good first step. What do you expect to find there? Mm -hmm. What's been done? Aerial photos are another um, really interesting um, way to find out what's, what's been done. And actually, we just worked at a, a local site where we had old aerial photos. And you could actually see the difference in the photos using the stereo pairs. Mm -hmm. And you could see the difference in how much fill we, we think was excavated from the site and, and backfilled since that time. So you can gain a lot of information from that. So you kind of take what's been, what's available mm -hmm. and then try to come back with, okay, what, what do we think we need? Are we in a, a seismic area? Maybe mm -hmm. we'll select and we'll, we'll do a C, CPT tests okay. to, to gain more information on what's there. Maybe it's um, a fill area. So a fill area, maybe we'll select and we'll do more test pits. Because test pits are rapid. We, we are going to dig a hole in the ground. And we can rapidly go through a site and figure out, and try to figure out where the limits of fill may be. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a, a building site and we'll come in, we'll do SPTs just with soil borings to get an idea of what, what the foundation soils are. And another factor we'll look at is what structure are we going to build? Is it a skyscraper? Maybe with a skyscraper we want to use more sensitive test methods. Maybe mm -hmm. we'll do more CPTs. If it's a maybe a one or two story building locally, maybe we'll do soil borings. It's much easier to to get a drill rig on site in a short time period and under economical costs and we can, we can get on hill slopes and we can put in soil borings. So that might be um, one way we'll do that. You have to look at what the building codes are. In some areas, well, in, in most places they're gonna require so many soil borings and or test pits will need to be done per square footage of building footprint. You might get into some areas where maybe they're not as receptive to CPT, which is really just um, getting going. So you might mm -hmm. see, see some building officials that are not as familiar and they still want soil borings. So you may, may encounter that. You might have time constraints. 
maybe we can't get a, a CPT rig here, so we'll do SPT, SPTs. And we might have just site constraints. We recently had a site where it was very soft soils and we were worried about drilling where we would cause too many vibrations, where we could have trouble during, during installation of the boring. So in that application, we could use a CPT because in that we just have a cone where we, we drive it into the ground. So it's, it's not as disruptive as, as a soil boring would be. So lots of different things and uh, different considerations when you come out with your plan and, and no site is the same. You would never have, okay, we're just always gonna do the same thing. So you, you would go through and you gotta really decide what do you have, what are your constraints, what do you need, what do you need for your design and so forth. Okay, you just mentioned uh, some information on uh, test pits. I was wondering if you could explain uh, what type of information we could get from those test pits in the field. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, a test pit is simply an excavation in the ground. It can be just simple, you have your shovel out there digging away, or you, you have an excavator that comes out, and you can do a, a wide variety of depths. It depends on which excavator, it could be a three foot wide, or it could be six foot wide. And basically, you come out and you dig the, a hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. And what's really nice with a test pit is it gives you an opportunity to see a wide range of the soil profile. Now, when you do soil borings or CPT, you only see a small fraction of what's in the ground. Now, a test pit only allows you to see to the depth you go down, but you can see the whole profile and you can, you can see in here what the sidewalls look like. In this test pit, we only went down about four feet because it was a, what we needed for this project. But we can also, from the test pit, you actually get in here and you, have, you log it like you would a soil boring. So you're familiar with soil borings. Are you familiar with what this, the types of information you have in the soil boring? Well, we do the same thing with a, a test pit log. We record how deep it is, what the moisture content or what the moisture level is. Is it, is it moist? Is it saturated? We also can use the pocket penetrometer. If you're familiar with one of those, you can actually take the pocket penetrometer and go all along the soil profile and stick it right into the side walls, stick it into the base excavation and get an, an idea of what the soil strength is. And we can also take a, a soil probe. These are all the cool tools you get as a geotechnical engineer. If the whole back of your truck, your truck will be full of fun, fun, cool things. But this is a soil probe, so you can actually just take it out and you probe the bottom of the hole. Are, are, have we hit rock? Can we still go deeper? you know, punch it into the sidewall. And you can correlate, you know, okay, I can push this rod in probably 100 pounds of force, maybe. So you can correlate that with how far you can push the rod in, <coughs> excuse me, and get an idea of the soil strength. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so you can get, actually get a wide variety of, of information on the test pits. <coughs> it's a great way to supplement your soil boring information. You know, you, like I said, you could take one soil boring in one small area here, and you can only see that one soil column all the way down. Now here, we can open it up. You can get an idea. We might see one teeny tiny piece of asphalt in the soil boring. Well, here we can see, oh yeah, we have an entire layer of asphalt that's fill, and we can see that, that spread over the whole test pit. So we keep track on our test pit log what the, what the soil profile looks like. We actually make a sketch and you just look at it, what do you see? I see boulders here, I see roots coming down, I see a pocket of fill, and you describe it, and that's your, it's, it's your information. And sometimes I think when you look at these, it seems, it seems simple, but it provides a great deal of information that can really supplement your information on your site. And what's nice about test pits is that for maybe $500 mobilization charge or $1,000 a day. It depends on what area you're in mm -hmm. with, with the cost, but you can hire an excavator and an operator and you can dig pits all day long. Mm -hmm. So wherever you, wherever you wanna put them. So it's great, you can, you can get a lot of information for low cost and they can help supplement your, your soil borings. And your soil borings may cost for, usually they charge you on a linear foot basis. So maybe it'll be $15 a linear foot plus $15 each sample you take. So if we drive every two feet down, we have to pay for a sample. 
-hmm. So you may spend $750 on one soil boring and it might take you half a day to get information on that, that soil column. But test pits, you can, you can go through and get a good, good idea on, on what you have there. Some um, disadvantages are, well, another, I guess another advantage is you can also see what the groundwater is doing. Is it, mm -hmm. uh, it going to fill up? And sometimes you can leave these open for a, a little bit while you're working on the site and see, does, does the groundwater come up? How fast is it filling? So that helps supplement your, your information. Um, one of the disadvantages is um, you really can't go into any pit that's deeper than four feet. It's mm -hmm. an OSHA requirement. It's a, a safety requirement. So anything deeper than four feet, you either need to do bracing or you need to uh, bench your excavation back. And you also need to have a ladder so that you can easily get out. So those are um, some of the things to think about. And also, if you're in certain areas, and you excavate all this fill material, if you're an environmental site, mm -hmm. that will now be considered material that you have to dispose of, and they won't let you put that back in the hole. Same thing with water, where if you, once you bring water out of the hole, now you're a generator. So you might have to contain that in drums and dispose of it. Mm -hmm. So it's things that you, that you need to think about. But you can get samples, you can send these off to the lab, get your particle size, you can do your atabric limits, and get great disturbed samples. Okay, uh, you did mention the comparison of the test mm -hmm. pits to the, uh, the soil boring logs. Um, I was wondering what, what scenarios would you want to more use test pits or the, the boring logs, you know, depending on the, the type of site that mm -hmm. you're looking well, at? I think that soil borings can provide a great deal of information. And here's one of your logs that you're using for class. What's um, really useful is one, you can get a sample of the entire soil column, depending on what your recoveries are. And your, your end values or your, from your blow counts is very useful. A lot of times you can correlate those with soil strength, which is um, extremely valuable for granular type soils where you can correlate the, the relative density and the, the strength. And if you do hit cohesive soils, the SPT values are not as useful for those. And, a lot of times for those cases you'll want to take a Shelby tube sample which is mm -hmm. a an undisturbed sample and, and then you can send it off for laboratory testing but you can get a, a great deal of information here's just a, a picture of a this one is considered a truck mounted or I'm sorry a tire mounted drill rig and this one is track mounted and I think one of the first things I learned is a geotechnical engineer I used a mobilization charge for a tire mount because it was a nice open field. I said, should be able to drive on that, no problem. Mm -hmm. So the first time I went out there, it got stuck. <laughs> so now we had a delay because now we couldn't, we couldn't do the boring because now I had to wait until we could get a track mounted out there. And we had to pay a second mobilization charge for the, the track mounted rig. So track mounts are great. They can go just about anywhere, you know, up steep slopes, some um, if it's, uh, anytime the ground is wet, Mm -hmm. uh, track mounted is a, a good way to go, but a, a little bit slower and sometimes the energy may be a little bit less than what you can, you can get on your, these bigger tire mounted, but, but important to pay attention to. And here's a picture of a typical example of what you get from when you, when you do your sampling. This is a split spoon sampler and as we're difficult to see from this picture, but as we're, as we're sampling, we're pounding down this, this sampler that goes into the ground. And it's called a split spoon because we, once we drill this in, we can actually take it out and we can open it up. And when we open it up, we can characterize the soil from, from the top all the way to the bottom. So when we do our, our end values, we, we measure our blow counts every six inches coming down. So we can actually see that this is a, a two foot long split spoon sampler. And we can estimate where our change in stratigraphy is, if we have moisture, what our, our different soil layers look like. If we have, you know, if we encounter, um, if it, is it silt, is it sand? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of the, the fun part of geotechnical engineering. You can get in here and you can, you can feel the, the grit. 
And you learn just by experience, the, the more soil you see, the better you get at it. When you can feel those grains, it's mm -hmm. a sand. Sometimes when it's shiny, it's a, a silt. And you can do those, um, those tests where you put that little pat of, of your soil in your palm with a little bit of soil on top. And if you hit that and the water gets sucked up in, into the soil, that's mm -hmm. a, a silt right. or fine sand. If it doesn't, it's a clay. So all those types of, of simple tests you can do in the field to give you an idea of how to classify, classify this. You, it's important to see what your recovery is in here. So some of the things you would write down how much we recovered on this sample. Mm -hmm. One of the difficulties is sometimes you'll get a little bit of, of fluff, I guess you could say, that gets pulled into the, into the sampler when they start drilling. And I always double check with a driller to make sure I know exactly where that, that, what is part of the sample and what's not. And then you can characterize and then you can, you can determine where along on your soil boring this, these different, different layers are. So here you characterize brown silt down for two feet and then you would continue on for every two foot increment as you go down with the soil boring. And then here's a, another one. So in here you could see that this, you can almost see that this is a little bit moist. This was a, a fine to medium sand with trace of gravel, trace of fine gravel in certain sections and moist. Even though you can't really, you really have to be hands on. Mm -hmm. You can't really check from pictures, but we'll do for purpose of illustration. And then when we get to this one, this one is interesting because you can see where it's a little bit it's got a little bit more water in that. Sometimes you have to double check because the, the drillers sometimes add water into the augers if it's really dry. So you gotta make sure that it's actually in fact water. And the, mm -hmm. the drillers are a tremendous resource in the field. They're really experts and I really value their opinions on, on, on some of their observations that they make. And sometimes it's interesting also, you might see a sample that, that looks wet on the outside Mm -hmm. and you'll think, oh, this is where the water table is. But if you come down and you, you run your finger along the whole thing, you'll actually see that it's just dry underneath where it just carried the water down. So it's really based on a lot of interpretations. And you know, you just get out there and get your hands wet and you'll know, not be afraid, put it in your, you know, rub it in your fingers and, and um, classify that. So you just mentioned to us um, that after doing some of these field tests, you bring the samples into the labs for testing. So I was wondering if you could describe for us the selection process of a proper laboratory test based on the nature of the project. Well, it's very much dependent on the type of project, but some basic tests that are, that are typically done would be soil classification. And you would bring your samples into the lab from different soil types that you encountered, from your soil borings, from your test pits, and different observations you've made. And then you take them and you do a particle size analysis. You do your hydrometer tests. Maybe you'll do. Maybe you'll look at um, compaction tests. Mm -hmm. So those sorts of tests um, are commonly done. Other tests that you you may be considering is if you if you find a silt sample or clay sample, Atterberg limits are very important. Mm -hmm. Do you have a? Is it more of a cohesive, a cohesive soil? cohesive soil that will, will drive your design and then where the moisture content becomes very important. So those are our typical tests that, that you would do on disturbed samples. If when you're putting in your soil borings, if you encounter very soft cohesive soils, then you may want to push a Shelby tube and a Shelby tube will give you an undisturbed sample. Even though there's always some level of disturbance in the sample, that's the, the best we can do in, when we install our soil borings. And sometimes if you're concerned about sample disturbance, you can x-ray them. And, and I have seen several projects where we've actually done that, where you go through and you pick the best tube that's representative of the soil conditions. And then from there, depending on the, the project, are you looking at doing permeability tests, consolidation tests, or different triaxial strength tests? So it's really project dependent, but you can see all different all different types of tests that you would do. And um, in terms of like the interpretation, it's very important to have a good understanding of how these tests work. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to order a test unless you know what you're going to do with the data. What, what does that data mean? 
you know, you don't want to, uh, it's a very competitive market. You don't want to do tests that aren't needed. Right. Mm -hmm. So we are just going to limit and make sure that, that you get the information that you need. So that's the best part of um, being a student and one of the very important parts of your training are that you're, that you're actually in the lab. You've got, you've got hands-on experience. You become familiar with different ASTM testing procedures. And just becoming familiar with some of those methods, those things are key to all of these. Every test method and every sample you send to the laboratory, you're going to say, you want this performed in accordance with this ASTM standard. Mm -hmm. That way, all tests are performed to the same, the same standard. So there's, there's no guesswork. And the more you do, the more you get hands-on experience in the lab, you'll see that, you know, oh, I didn't quite follow, I didn't quite follow what I was supposed to do. No, I didn't want to wait for my consolidation test, so we took our readings a little bit early. No one will ever know the difference. Well, you, you can really tell the difference. And so hopefully, as part of your training as a student, you'll see that, yeah, this is very important when you get your lab report back mm -hmm. and, yeah, we should have waited on this one when we get a bad grade and our results didn't look like everyone else's. So that, that part is, is very important to understand. And a lot of things, when you're interpreting the data, you have to remember also and take into consideration, you're only sampling a very small percentage of your site. If you have a, an acre site, you're, or even if you have a, you know, if you, if, even if you're taking one soil boring every 2,500 square feet, mm -hmm. you're only looking at this very small percentage of that, that total area. So if you do a, a test on one small interval of one small percentage of, of the, the site, you, it, you really lend you, do you really have to have some basic interpretations and, mm -hmm. and trusting your lab data is key. If you, get a, a, if you get results that don't make sense, you need to ask those questions. If you don't understand it, you need to ask those questions. How did you run this? You need to know if the number you're using is the number you think you're using, not someone else. Someone else did the test, but you didn't realize it was drained versus undrained. Mm -hmm. Those things can um, make a huge impact on your final design, and um, we don't want to see failures or anything result from that. Right. So lots mm -hmm. of lots of liability in that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Dr. Smith, I want to thank you for coming in mm -hmm. today and uh, sharing this with the class. Uh, I was just wondering if there is any last bit of advice you want to give the students. I think just have a, a, I think have a great time in school and learn as much as you can. When you get out in the, the working world, it's, it's fast and it, this is the time you, sh you should take time and, and study and know the literature sources, you know, and, you know, go through, you know, your textbooks and know what those references are. Pull out this, pull out the standards, you know, don't be afraid in, in lab class to, to get your, your hands in the, the bowl when you're when you're running these tests and, and really develop an understanding. You know, don't be afraid to take soil and, you know, put a little bit between the teeth and see if you can feel the grains of sand. <laughs> you know, those, those types of things. And this is your, really when you move forward, this is your base, your foundation, for lack of a better word, for your future. So, so take that time and, and do the best job you can.